Hello everyone. I'm back with another live stream. This is April 11th of 2024, Thursday night. Thanks to all those who joined and I'm hoping that more people will join over the next few minutes. And so I will wait for a minute or two as I wait for more people to join and there are some um, important things that I'm going to be discussing. I'll talk about uh, the migrant crisis in Denver. I'll also talk about uh, Trump versus Biden debate. And then I'll also talk about what's happening in Wisconsin regarding um, a very important congressional race. And so lots to discuss, lots to digest, lots to uh, think about. And so I would appreciate if you stay engaged in the live chat window and share your thoughts, share your comments, ask questions. So with that, my friends, I'm going to wait for a few more minutes. Uh, not a few more minutes, maybe another minute, another 60 seconds before I get started. Now, I do understand that as soon as I start the live stream, it might take, uh, you know, a few minutes for people to get notifications and to tune in. Um, so let's wait. My allergies are are still bothering me. I mean, the weather's been a little crazy. We have had uh, a little bit of sunshine but then today it's raining again it's raining again in madison wisconsin all right my friends as you join as you tune in please write something in the live chat window if this is your first time write your name first name is fine you don't have to write your whole name write the name of the city and the state that you're from, if you're from the United States, if you are from outside USA, write the name of the country that you're from. I want to know that. So my friends, um, I will get started in just a couple more seconds. So let's talk about what's happening in Denver. The mayor of Denver, his name is Mike Johnston. Okay, don't forget that name, Mike Johnston, the mayor of Denver, he announced um, a new program, a new program to deal with the migrant influx. And so the plan is to extend support to the migrants for six months, but only limit that to thousand spaces about a thousand spaces now one thousand spaces that's a lot okay you can't say only a thousand spaces although i've seen that uh at, in at least one news report where um it was stated only one thousand spaces but think about it one thousand spaces is not only that's a lot okay how about the city used 1,000 spaces for homeless veterans. How about the city allocate 1,000 spaces for disabled Americans who are living in Denver? How about 1,000 um, spaces for seniors or for Americans who have faced eviction because they cannot keep up with the rising cost of housing? I mean, if you really want to help 1,000 individuals, focus on 1,000 American citizens. Could be veterans, could be seniors, could, could be disabled Americans, could be 1,000, um, you know, low-income individuals facing uh, risk of homelessness or homelessness. But instead, mayor of Denver... Do you remember what his name is? I mentioned that. 
Remember the name of the mayor of Denver, Mike Johnston. And the reason why I'm saying that you should remember the name is because Mike Johnston of Denver, Eric Adams of New York, Brandon Johnson of Chicago, they are some of the worst mayors in America. Okay? So these are, in the list of the worst mayors in America, they are, they are at the very top. They are at the very top, okay? And so Mike Johnston, one of the worst mayors. Eric Adams, one of the worst mayors. Brandon Johnson, one of the worst mayors. Um, don't forget their names because you have to pay attention to what these, what these guys are up to, what they are doing. So Mayor Mike Johnston... Of, of Denver, he wants 1,000 spaces for migrants. And not only that, reportedly the new plan in the city of Denver is to place asylum seekers, okay? These, these migrants, actually illegal immigrants, to place these illegal immigrants in apartments for up to six months, all right, for up to six months, and and to also provide uh, job training, skills training, and to give them um, opportunities to get different kinds of certifications and to help them with food and to help them with asylum applications. So it, it seems like the city of Denver, these liberals in Denver, they they seem to be they seem to be very much committed to helping the migrants. Okay, uh, I mean, I, I'm not seeing any conversation about American homeless, the American citizens who are homeless. I'm not hearing any conversations about the homeless veterans, disabled veterans, or just, you know, disabled individuals in general. I'm, I'm not hearing anything about, uh, you know, other American citizens who are, who, are, who are struggling because of, you know, the rising cost of living. But the city of Denver with Mike Johnston in charge as the mayor, the city of Denver, the government seems to be very, very concerned about the migrants. I mean, who, who, who are the migrants? Who are the migrants? Who are the migrants? They are foreign nationals who decided, hey, let's cross the border. Let's go to the United States and let's, you know, hope for some free stuff. Okay? That, those are the migrants in Denver counting on free stuff. Free for them, not for the American taxpayers. And now, Denver wants to have this program, this new program called the Denver Asylum Seeker Program. I mean, you know, this is this is what the liberals do. They come up with some fancy terms, fancy names. The Denver Asylum Seeker Program. Oh my God, they're seeking asylum. In Denver, we got to have a new program. And what's this new program? There, the, the city will have 1,000 spaces, 1,000 spaces, and they will extend support to the migrants for up to, for uh, extend support to the migrants for six months. Extend support to six months. And, of course, I mentioned about the job training, the skills training, the, uh, the, the opportunities to get certifications and food assistance, blah, 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 blah. I mean, this, this may not be all. The liberals are going to come up with more kinds of services and, and, and opportunities and assistance and help for the migrants. What about the American citizens? In Denver, reportedly, there are roughly 800 migrants, 800 migrants currently in Denver's shelters, 
And they would reportedly be the first in line for this new program. They'd be the first in line for the asylum seeker, the Denver asylum seeker program. I mean, sounds pretty fancy, right? Denver asylum seeker program. What it what it is is it, it's it's a new way for the liberal politicians in Denver to just hand over more taxpayer dollars to the migrants. That's that's what this is. Okay. I mean, call you whatever you want. Call it whatever you want. The Denver Asylum Seeker Program. Okay. They're seeking asylum. We got to help them. No, we have to help our own people. We have to help American citizens. That's the priority. I've said it before. I'll say it again. My friends, as you are joining, please write something in the live chat window. Participate. Trust me. You write something in the chat window, and I will, I will do my best to address your comment. I'll do my best to answer your question. I want you to write something in the chat window. It's right there. You can see it in the chat window. Write a comment, and it'll pop up on my end. Write your name. Write your first name. Introduce yourself. Tell me how you found this channel. Tell me if this is your first time tuning in for a live stream. Tell me where you are from. Tell me something about your political views. Are you a conservative? Are you a liberal? Are you a moderate? Are you in a swing state, in a purple state? Are you in a solid red state? Are you in a solid blue state? My friend JW is here. Good evening, JW writes. It's JW from Ohio, and JW is great about tuning in for my live streams here. And JW is from Ohio, and and I have I've gotten to know JW through this through this through this channel because JW frequently participates in the live chat. So be like JW and participate in the live chat. JW is from a wonderful state named Ohio. We all know Ohio, major, major state. And I'm hoping that in November of 2024, the incumbent Democrat senator of Ohio, Sherrod, Sherrod, Sherrod Brown, right? He's going to be defeated by Bernie Moreno. Is that going to happen, JW? What are your thoughts? Is that going to happen? Are we going to have Bernie Moreno as the new U.S. Senator from Ohio? My friends, I am always optimistic. I'm always thinking positive. J.W. writes, yes, hopefully Bernie will get it. That's what I am hoping as well. Bernie Moreno, a man with an immigrant background, a man who understands the American dream, the man who understands the importance of limited government and free market. That's the kind of U.S. Senator we want from Ohio. So I'm hoping Bernie Moreno wins the election. Very different from Bernie Sanders. The two Bernies are very, very different. Bernie Sanders is a diehard socialist. And Bernie Moreno is a freedom-loving American. Let's see. Uh, Maya Sisters is here. Maya Sisters from Wisconsin. Middleton, Wisconsin, to be very accurate. Because Maya Sisters mentioned that to me previously. That's how I know. So you see, I get to know, I get to know the people who, who tune in for my live streams. Write a comment. Don't be shy. Write a comment. Just say hello. If you don't want to write anything, just give me a thumbs up. Give me a thumbs up. Or put a smiley face. Tell me something about the state that you're from. What are the policy issues that you're concerned about? What is it that you're worried about? Is there, is there something? Is there some political concern, some policy concern that keeps you up at night? Well, I, I sleep rather comfortably on most nights. Uh, but I sleep very little. You know, I, I stay up past midnight. So I sleep very little. But I, I do get decent sleep 
But the only thing that really bothers me and has been bothering me for months now is the inflation. Because I can see how people are suffering every single day because of inflation. So Maya Sisters is here. Welcome, Maya Sisters. JW is here. And JW agrees with me because he says, JW says, yes, the Bernies are opposites. So JW writes, so Maya, what do you think lately? Do you think Trump will win Wisconsin? That's a great question. It's addressed to Maya Sisters, so I'll let Maya Sisters answer that. And then I'm also um, happy to try to make some predictions there. Maya Sisters writes, Wisconsin is a toss-up. That is true. Wisconsin is really a toss-up. I mean, I want to be optimistic and I want to say that we're going to win Wisconsin. But then again, I don't want to be overconfident. Because that's what I thought in 2020. I thought, we had it. Trump's going to get the 10 electoral college votes from Wisconsin. That did not happen to be the case, sadly. So in 2024, we're going to be optimistic, but cautiously optimistic. Uh, JW writes, you should answer too, of course, Tasif. I will answer that. You know, I think the momentum is on Trump's side. I think Trump is gaining momentum every day. When he came to Green Bay, he, when he came to Green Bay on April the 2nd, I won't forget that date because that's the date Trump came to Green Bay after a while, after quite a while. But that day was also the spring election day in Wisconsin. There was snowstorm, lots of snow, snow-covered roads. But people went to Green Bay to attend Donald Trump's rally. They defeat the weather. They defeated the, the, the snowy roads and all the, all the travel inconvenience. And they went, Trump supporters went to Green Bay to attend that rally. My friends, I think the momentum is on Trump's side because people understand what's happening to our country. People can see the destruction caused by the Democrats, by the liberals, by the socialist politicians. And as I was saying, what's happening in Denver? Mike Johnston in Denver, the mayor there. He may be a mayor, but he's not a leader. Because he is prioritizing the illegal immigrants rather than thinking about the American citizens, rather than thinking about the, the veterans who served our country, rather than thinking about the senior citizens who worked hard all their life, rather than thinking about the American children living in poverty. So instead of thinking about the veterans, the seniors, the disabled Americans, the children, Mayor Mike Johnston, not a leader, a mayor, because he got the title, but he's not a leader. He's caring about the illegal immigrants. He wants to provide support. The city under the city wants to provide support to a thousand migrants for six months. Think about that. This is what's going on in Denver. That is an American city in crisis, a beautiful city in crisis because of the liberals and their policies, their bad, bad policies. The Denver Asylum Seeker Program. We don't need any Denver Asylum Seeker Program. We need programs for freedom-loving Americans. We need programs for hardworking individuals. U.S. citizens. My sisters writes, the U.S. Senate race typically generates a lot of excitement. Eric Hovde, Republican primary frontrunner, has made some, I don't know, what comments did he make? Um, uh, wh what comments are you referring to, my sisters? If you, if you want to share, that'd be great. Now, you know, the Wisconsin Senate race is probably going to be one of the most watched Senate races this November. And this is going to be an expensive race. I can tell you that. I don't know 
How many millions are going to be spent from each side? But I'm sure millions, millions, multi, 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 millions, maybe tens of millions, millions are going to be spent because this is going to be a very expensive race. All eyes are on Wisconsin because you know what? It's not just about the individual Senate race. It's definitely about the Senate race because the Republicans want to regain majority in the in the Senate. So it's about the Senate race. But also, if 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 the Republicans can can do better get out the vote campaign by drawing attention to the Senate race, then that's gonna help Trump. That's gonna help Trump. And that's why even in districts, and the US Senate race is a statewide race, but even in districts, congressional districts where, you know, that may be solid blue, it's still important for the Republicans to have candidates and strong candidates and candidates who are going to be working very hard, perhaps knowing that they're not going to be able to win, but it's still important for Republicans to run, to have candidates, because you know what? Every vote, every every voter who, who goes to the polling booth to vote for a Republican candidate down ballot is likely going to vote for the Republican uh, presidential nominee, Donald Trump. So, you know, like here, here in the second congressional district in Wisconsin, which is, let, let's be honest, it's a solid, solid blue district, okay? And it is extremely difficult for a Republican candidate to win in the second congressional district of Wisconsin. And Maya Sisters knows about this because Maya Sisters, if, Maya Sisters, if you live in Middleton, you live in the second congressional district, you know that. And this is such a challenging district for the Republicans because this is solid blue. Solid blue. But still, do we give up? No, we don't. We still want Republicans to run in, for various offices in the 2nd Congressional District. You know, run for State Assembly, run for State Senate, run for Congress. Even if you think you're not going to be able to win, you still must run because as soon as you run, you help generate energy. And, and you know, that gives people hope and people then feel energized and enthusiastic about going to the, going to the polling location on election day. And if they are going to vote for a Republican candidate for Congress, if they are going to vote for a Republican candidate for state assembly or state senate, even if those races are in solid Democrat districts, but as soon as those Republican voters go out and they vote, they don't only vote for their candidates for Congress, for state Senate, state assembly. They also, on the same ballot, they are likely to end up voting for Donald Trump too. And so while, may, while we may not end up winning the congressional seat, in a, in a very, very solid blue district. But that energy among the voters and, and, and the volume of voters, the increased volume of voters, helps the statewide race. So it would help the U.S. Senate candidate, and it's also going to help the statewide race for president. And then it'll help Donald Trump win the electoral college vote from Wisconsin. And so it's important to have candidates running in, in districts that are solid red, leaning red, toss up, and even districts that are leaning blue or solid blue. You must have candidates. Republicans must have candidates running for, for, for all available seats. Okay? All right. Uh, let's see. Uh, so my sisters, I'm gonna be, I'm gonna be, um, you know, doing a little bit more study about the U.S. Senate race um, in Wisconsin. You know, I'm, I'm following it. I'm paying attention, um, but you know, I'm gonna be paying even more attention. Okay. And um, one thing to keep in mind is that. These, these attack ads on TV, I mean, those attack ads can be pretty vicious. 
and um, you know, um, and those ads cost a lot of money, and that's why I keep saying that this race is going to end up being very, very expensive. But at the end of the day, the people must have to, the people should look at records, as my sisters just wrote. Baldwin's record is very weak. Uh, and so, you know, you look at your incumbent and you see what is the what has the incumbent done for the state or for the country in general, okay? So you look at um, a, a Democrat senator like uh, Tammy Baldwin. I mean, you got to ask the question, what are her legislative accomplishments, okay? And one thing I'll point out, the Democrats... They, they engage in the process of earmarks, okay? And, and that is just a way to engage in reckless government spending. And, and, and so that's, that's something that the Democrats have started doing. Uh, and, you know, these earmarks, this, this practice was, um, you know, it, it was there before and then it was gone for a while and now it's back again and the Democrats heavily engage in that process of congressionally directed spending called earmarks. And, and in the process, they just spend lots and lots of taxpayer dollars on various projects throughout, throughout their state and their districts. So, you know, just it's important to look at the records. And, and then you look at the incumbent and say, what's, what's the incumbent's record? You know, what's Tammy Baldwin's record? And, and that's an important question to ask, because then you think, OK, what's the alternative? OK, we've got a candidate, a GOP candidate, Eric Hovde, running for running for Senate. So, OK, now let's share Eric Hovde's ideas. What is he going to do? Uh, what are the policies he's supporting? And I know he supports border security. I know he supports uh, the idea of restore, restoring the American dream, because the American dream is slipping out of people's hands. You know, many people they cannot think about buying a house even if they have even if they have saved money for down payment, the interest rates are so high. It, it's not possible for many Americans, young Americans in particular, to buy a house. And then if they rent, rent is going up because of crisis in the real estate market, because of crisis in like the overall housing market. And so the American dream is slipping out of people's hands. And so, okay, do you want a candidate who's going to secure the border? Do you want a candidate who's going to restore the American dream? Do you want a candidate, you know, who's going, who supports limited government and more freedom? Well, then, all right. If you, if you want all of that, vote for the conservative, vote, vote for the Republican. Because what has the incumbent Democrat done in all these years? The incumbent Democrat, Senator Baldwin, is part of, is part of the, the Biden camp, right? Is a Biden ally. And what has Biden done? What has the congressional Democrats, what, what, have, what, what did the congressional Democrats do with, with the power that they have? In the Senate, they have the majority. And, and so what did they do? They engaged in reckless government spending that has fueled inflation and inflation is making everyone suffer all right um my sisters writes tosif you and i will research the candidates legislative accomplishments yeah you know in in case of an incumbent you you have to research the legislative accomplishments and you may very well see that a lot of incumbent democrats they don't have legislative accomplishments and, and, you know, so they heavily engage in earmarks and they, they spread money all over, all over the district and the state. Uh, but you know what? Uh, that's not a, a responsible way uh, to, to do things, to, to, to govern and to legislate. Uh, JW writes, yes, interest rates high, groceries high, credit card debt high, gas high, inflation is going in the wrong direction. Crazy. Exactly, exactly. And so... My sisters also writes, low information voters will only listen to sound bites from the campaign ads. JW, yeah, I hope Havdi doesn't provide any additional ammunition. So, you know, um, my sisters, I, I see uh, your comments. I'm going to do more research um, before, I, before I address those. 
Um, I've met Eric Havdi in person. I was there for his uh, campaign launch event. Actually, I attended his campaign launch event the day he uh, did the press conference. He had the reporters there. He had his supporters, and he officially launched his campaign. He stood at the podium, delivered a speech about what, why he was running, what he was going to, what he's going to do. And so I was there in that room. Um, you know, I've got a picture with uh, Mr. Havdi from that event. And, uh, you know, I, I have confidence that he's going to do good. But obviously, I also understand that this campaign, uh, it's not going to be an easy one. Because anytime there's an incumbent who has been there for a term or two, um, you know, that candidate uh, has a lot of influence. And so uh, for a challenger, it, it, it may be an uphill battle. But then again, when the incumbent doesn't have legislative accomplishments, when the incumbent hasn't done anything to help the people, uh, and when the incumbent is on the same side as the administration, the Biden administration that has engaged in reckless spending uh, and, and you know opening up the border, then obviously the, the challenger, in this case, Eric Havdi, has a lot of points to, to publicly point out. Like, hey, Tammy Baldwin, what, what, what have you done? Why is the border open? Why do we have a migrant crisis? You know, why is inflation so high? Why are gas prices so high? I mean, these are all legitimate questions. And so, my friends, let me, let me go back to what I was saying um, in, in terms of Denver. I mean, you look at Denver, and that can be a great example of the, of the kind of, um, you know, chaos and the kind of mess that Democrats create through their, uh, you know, uh, illegal immigration-friendly policies. Yeah, I said that. The Democrat policies are friendly towards illegal immigrants. The Democrats have illegal immigration-friendly policies, while the conservatives have law and order policies. They have, th their policies are constitutional. Their policies uh, support freedom-loving Americans. Their policies, the, the Republican policies, the Republican policies are law and order policies. The Republican policies are freedom-loving American policies. The Republican policies are, are border security policies. The Republican policies are energy independence policies. And the Democrat policies are just the opposite. And that's why with the Democrats in charge in the Senate, in the White House, we have high gas prices and we have, um, uh, you know, high inflation and we have an open border and we have 10 plus million illegal immigrants who have crossed the border and entered the United States expecting free stuff. So going back to Denver, uh, as I said, roughly 800 migrants are currently in the city's shelters, and they would be the first in line for this new program that the, the mayor is talking about, the Denver Asylum Seeker Program. The city expects, uh, you know, to cap the, the capacity uh, at 1,000, and they believe that that 1,000 limit will be reached in, in, in a few days. And I also want to point out, um, if people arrive, if people arrive uh, in Denver after after uh, that 1,000 uh, space limit has been reached, then those migrants, the new arrivals, will be placed in a congregate shelter, and they'll, they'll be given a maximum of 72 hours until they you know, 72 hours to basically find the next place uh, to go to, okay? Or they'll be directed to some services, um, you know, uh, uh, some outside services, or, or you know, they'll, they'll be, they'll have to move to a new city. And so, you know, what you can expect in Colorado is to see uh, migrants moving from Denver out to other other areas. So this problem is going to spread in Colorado, and you know a lot of migrants from Colorado from Denver may decide to go to other states. Okay, and so then this problem will spread to other states. Uh, many many states are already suffering. And okay, 
So it seems that some migrants are actually upset. I mean, can you imagine that? I mean, these migrants, they are, they are here in the United States. They just crossed the border, decided to come in, hoping for free stuff. And now that they are running into capacity limits in Denver, or, or you know, they're not going to get uh, free housing that they, that they counted on, and instead they'll get, uh, you know, a maximum of 72 hours to figure out what to do next. They're not happy. They're sad. They're upset. Okay? And those who advocate for the migrants are also not happy because they want more and more free stuff. You know, why this 1,000 space limit? You know, make it unlimited. Why, the, why this 72-hour uh, uh, limit uh, in the congregate shelter? Make it, make it unlimited. Give, give them all the support. Take everything you can out of the pockets of the American taxpayers and give those dollars to the migrants. Give more money, more money, more money, everything to the migrants. That's what these advocates want. The advocates who advocate, who, who the advocates who, who, who favor these migrants, what they want is you empty your pockets, American taxpayer, empty your pockets, you know, take your wallet, take everything out of your wallet, whatever money you got, give it to the migrants. That, that's, what, that's what these left-wing advocates want. They want you and I, American taxpayers, to empty our pockets, take out all the dollar bills, all the, all the quarters, all the pennies, all the dimes and nickels, and whatever you have, you know, just go and hand it over to the government so that they can, they can fund the migrant shelters. And so that they can give free medical service and free food and everything to the migrants. They want these advocates, these crazy left-wing advocates, they want American taxpayers to go bankrupt so that the migrants can have year-long leisure and relaxation. Okay? That, that's exactly what's happening. I mean, talk to the American veterans and ask them about the suffering that they are going through. Many veterans are waiting to see a doctor, waiting in line for months. Many veterans need psychiatric help. They need mental health services that they are not getting. Many veterans need surgeries that they are having to wait for. Many veterans don't, don't have good food on the table. Many veterans don't have warm clothes. Many veterans don't have roof over their head. Many veterans are suffering in isolation. They are lonely. Many veterans don't know what their future is. And, and, and these liberals, instead of worrying about American veterans, people who served our country, people who lost limbs, people who, who, who suffered trauma while serving, people who need help, Instead of worrying about American veterans, the liberals care about the migrants, the migrants who just decided to cross the border, you know, make your way to the border in a caravan, cross the border and demand free stuff. That's who these advocates care about. The left-wing politicians, they care about those migrants who want free stuff. And who's going to pay for it? You and I, the American taxpayers. Let me read some comments here. Denver city officials are in a state of denial. They cannot afford to continuously fund migrants. We should not give a single penny to the migrants. Not a single penny. Not a single penny. Okay? I mean, my sisters, you're from Wisconsin. You're in Middleton. Are you hearing a lot about the housing issues? in the Dane County area, in Madison, in Middleton. And there's, there's housing crisis, rent is going up. And as I said, uh, you know, inventory is low. So even if you have a bag full of cash and you, you're ready to pay cash for a house, it's hard to find a, a, a house that fits your needs. And if, and you know, and not, every, not everyone can, can afford to pay cash. You know, people have to go for a mortgage. And those mortgage, 
the mortgage has become expensive because of high interest rates. And then many, many people, they, they just cannot afford to live in Middleton, to live in, to live in Madison, to live in Verona. My sisters knows what I'm talking about. The Dane County community. So people, people, people live in, in, you know, in other communities. They, they, they live like 30, 40 miles away. Even if they work in Madison or Middleton, they may be living in Dodgeville. They may be living in, you know, uh, some other place in, in Barneveld. They may be living in, um, you know, um, maybe in Lodi. Or they may be living in Richland Center. And Richland Center, too, has housing issues. It's not like those communities are, you know, they have abundant housing options. That's not the case. There are, there are people who, you know, who drive from Columbia County, people who drive from Greene County, people who drive from Grant County or, or Richland County or Lafayette County. My sisters, you know what I'm talking about, right? The, the people from out of state may not know what counties I'm referring to, but my sisters, you understand what I'm talking about. People drive 40, 50 miles because they can't afford to live in Dane County. And, and, and now we get this report that $700,000, according to an Institute for Reforming Government report, IRG, that $700,000 have been spent on the migrants. That's just in city of Madison. This is ridiculous. This is ridiculous. By the way, this is April 11th. And on April 13th, I will be in Cross Plains, Wisconsin, in Dane County. Speaking at the Second Congressional District Caucus, I'm the featured speaker there. So anyone who wants to attend, you can contact me for more information. My my sisters, you live in you live in Middleton, so uh, Cross Plains is not far far from you. So if you if you want, you can attend. Uh, my sisters writes: Rental prices are increasing. People trying to move out of Dane County and still be able to commute. Yeah, but then the other thing, my sisters. I mean, if you are, are living in, I don't know, uh, Darlington, okay? Let's say you're living in Darlington and, and you commute to Madison for work. Commute is not cheap. With gas prices at $3.4 per gallon, it's not easy. So if you're saving money on housing, you're going to be spending a whole bunch of money on gas. And it's not just gas, it's the wear and tear. It's your auto insurance. It's your repairs and maintenance. Oil, oil changes have become expensive. If you need brake service, you're going to have to spend a lot of money. If you need transmission fluid change, you're going to have to spend a lot of money. If you need new tires, just because you're driving on you know, harsh roads in the winter in Madison with the snow and the ice, those tires are expensive, and labor is expensive. So it's not just the, the parts and the, the equipment or whatever. If somebody's putting new tires on your vehicle, they are probably going to charge you a lot, lot more than what they charged you back in 2019. Okay? So my sister writes, Toss, if you're correct, it is cost-benefit analysis on commuting, commuting to work. Yeah, I, I'm glad you mentioned cost-benefit analysis. That was one of my courses in graduate school. I studied cost-benefit analysis. Um, and so that's something people will have to do. So my friends, at this time, I'm just going to say a few. Uh, I know there are, there are you know, uh, several people who tuned into this live stream. If you have not written a comment yet in the live chat window, please participate. I, I always want to make it a conversation, okay? Rather than just me speaking, I want this to be a conversation. So please participate in the live chat window. Just see my sisters, just see JW. We're having a great conversation here. So participate in the live chat window because I have more things to talk about. So in Denver, reportedly, uh, you know, the, the city has provided support to more than 40,000 migrants, 40K, 40, 40,000 migrants, 40,000 40, migrants since December of 2022. And 
Um, previously, this is according to a report I read, previously migrants who arrived in Denver could, you know, stay in the shelter uh, for, you know, two weeks to, I think, 42 days, based on the report I read, um, and that depended on whether they had children or not, so anywhere from two weeks to 42 days. And now the migrants will only be allowed to stay for, you know, up to 72 hours. So the migrants are not happy. They are not happy because they feel entitled when they come into the United States. Because a lot of migrants are told, hey, just go to U.S. Just go to Denver, go to New York, go to Chicago, go to San Francisco, go to Los Angeles. Just go to those communities. And your life is going to be a bed of roses. There won't be any more problems. You're going to get free housing. You're going to get free food. You can do whatever you want. And, and, and so where do these migrants get this information from? Because they can see what's happening. This is the day and age of social media. This is the day and age of social media. And, and, and the migrants, even, even before they get to the U.S., when they are still planning to come to the U.S., when they are finalizing their decision or when they are on their way in a caravan, they know, they, 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 get, they get the information about what Eric Adams is up to, Brandon Johnson, Mike Johnston, Joe Biden. The, the migrants know that these left-wing politicians, they prioritize the illegal immigrants and that's why more and more people keep coming. They keep coming, they cross the border and they just keep coming. So now the advocates who favor the migrants, they are not happy about the decision that Denver is making. They want more and more and more for the migrants. JW writes, I'm sure some blue Denver voters will flip red due to this ridiculousness. Unfortunately, not enough will flip, but I'm glad some of them will start realizing Dems have bad policies. The Dems have always had bad policies for a very, very long time. And it's shocking how long it's taking for people to realize it. You know, I have some uh, friends who are strongly liberals. And I, you know, some of them I haven't talked to in a while. And, and some of them I've talked to. And, you know, they, they, their voices have softened. <laughs> you know how, so previously... Uh, some of my you know, liberal friends, they had they had strong voice like, well, we don't want Trump. We don't want Trump. You know, he says this, Trump does that. I mean, what now? You complain about Trump tweeting, but you're okay with $3.40 per gallon gas? You are okay with... You are, you are okay with this sky-high inflation? You are okay with the border crisis? Are you okay with all this stuff? So, you know, I was, um, I, uh, on, my, on my way back from work today, I stopped at the grocery store. I had to buy a few things. You know, you pick up a few things and it's like 50 bucks. All right? I mean, things that should be like $30 are now $50, the total, because prices have gone up. So, um you know, I drink a lot of tea today. I don't have my tea cup. I just have water bottle. But I drink tea. I drink coffee. More tea than coffee. And so I picked up my usual box of um, tea bags, right? Uh, English breakfast tea. And I remember just a few years ago, this exact same box of 50 tea bags. I, I used to pay $4.99 for it. $4.99 and 99 cents and sometimes it was on sale and it cost me you know 50 cents less so it was more like four dollars and fifty cents today i paid seven dollars and 69 cents for that same box of tea bags and it's the same 50 50 tea bags not more okay same product same packaging it looks exactly the same you know sometimes companies will uh, you know, change the color on the packaging and make it more shiny or glittery or whatever, um, or change the, you know, the, the container type or the size. 
Nothing's changed. It's the exact same thing that I bought back in 2018, back in 2019, and it used, used to cause, it cost me $4.99. And like I said, sometimes uh, $4.50 because of ongoing sale at the time. But today I paid $7.69 for it. I mean, imagine the effect of inflation. Imagine what's happening in our economy. And this is just a, a box of key bags. Think about all the things that you buy, everything that you need in, in, in your home, in your household. I mean, it, it's just crazy, you know. Sometimes I want to cry when I, when I read the sticker price. It's like, oh, my God, how did we end up with Joe Biden? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to cry. How did, we, how did we end up with Joe Biden? Who voted for Joe Biden? And, and, you know, how did we get to this point? So you just want to cry. And sometimes you feel so shocked, you, you just want to laugh. Like, huh. <laughs> did we, did we, us, like Americans, like I didn't vote for Biden, no way. But, you know, I'm, I'm speaking in general terms. Like we as a country elected this guy? And I, I, I want to ask my... Democrat friends, like, what were you guys thinking? I'm, I'm so sad that I want to laugh. I want to laugh out loud at the ridiculousness that, that the voters allowed. Okay? It's, so it's just, it's just unbelievable. It's just unbelievable. And, and sometimes, so sometimes you're so sad you want to cry. Sometimes you're so shocked you want to just laugh because you feel helpless. You, you just laugh at yourself. You laugh at the voters who elected Biden. And sometimes you're just so shocked, you're like speechless. I got no comments. I, I have nothing to say. How did we end up here? Okay. So, J JW, you're, you're saying that some of them will start realizing that Dems have bad policies. Like, uh, I mean... They better realize now, because if, if they still don't realize, we're not going to have a country. If Joe Biden wins re-election in 2024, I mean, the economy is over, okay? The economy is done. We're going to have to go into a barter system, okay? We're, we're going to have to go into a barter. I mean, we're going to go back ages. We're not going to have this modern economy if Joe Biden wins re-election, we're going to do barter system. Like, I need some sugar, and, and JW needs some flour or salt. Well, here you go, JW. I'm going to give you, um, you know, um, I, 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 if you've got some sugar, you give me some sugar, and uh, if I've got some flour or some salt, I'll, we'll, we'll trade. So we're going to end up with a barter system. Okay? I mean, that's what's going to happen. This inflation is so crazy, money will lose its value. And then people will just have to trade like, you know, uh, ages ago, whatever people did as, as uh, you know, human beings evolved throughout generations and as civilization evolved. We're, we're, we're going to go back thousands of years. All right. We're going to have to trade stuff. We're not going to have a modern economy. I mean, we're going to get to that point where barter will start. Billy Wiggins writes, hi, Billy. Good, good to see that you're back. Uh, welcome. Thank you for joining. Billy writes, people barter with each other, wars in the street, ripping each other. I mean, you know, I don't know how barter is going to work, but it's like, hey, um, I, I need some sugar. Who's got sugar? All right, you've got sugar. Uh, okay, so what do you want from me so I can have, you know, um, uh, 200 grams of sugar? Oh, you need some some uh, corn flour. Okay, I'm going to give you some corn flour. You give me some sugar. I mean, that's, that's the society we're going to have if Joe Biden wins re-election. Okay? I mean, you know, this is real. I mean, it sounds unreal, but that's where we are heading. That's where we're heading. So, uh, let's see. JW writes, hope people will wake up. I hope so, too. I hope so, too. 
I mean, because what we're going through is a nightmare. So I, I hope people will wake up and take action and vote for Trump. So anyway, my friends, I got to tell you, um, I am looking forward to the Trump-Biden debate, okay? And I'm going to tr- share a little bit of my thoughts on this, but then I have another topic I want to discuss in just a little bit. Something happening in Wisconsin, which is not just a Wisconsin issue, it's a national issue. I mean, whether or not we're going to be able to keep the House majority, that would depend on what happens in Wisconsin. And I'm going to share with you that also a little later. But let me talk about the Trump-Biden debate. I want want to see a Trump-Biden debate, okay? And you know what Donald Trump said? I mean, this guy, this is what a leader should be like. I mean, this is leader. He's the definition of leader, okay? Trump is what leadership looks like. Trump says he will debate Biden anytime, anywhere, any place. Anytime, anywhere, any place. Anytime, anywhere, any place. That's what Trump said. And so, what is Joe Biden going to do? What? How? How is Joe Biden going to respond? Is he going to say, "All right, let's debate"? I mean, sometimes after a speech, Joe Biden doesn't even know which way he's going to go. Speech is over. He's staring at the crowd. He's standing in front of the podium. Is he going to go right? Is he going to go left? Where am I going to go? Where am I going to go? And, and then, obviously, there are folks who, uh, who tell him, Sir, this is the way. So, so, on one hand, we have this confused individual in the White House. And on the other hand, we have a real leader, Donald Trump, who's waiting to come back. And he's looking forward to making America great again, greater than ever before. It's going to be tough because Biden has created a mess with the border situation. And then the Biden's green, green agenda, green energy agenda is also, has also caused tremendous damage. And now, as I talked about in a video that I uploaded earlier this evening, Biden is like hanging this carrot in front of the young voters again because it's election time. He wants the, 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 the Gen Z and, and the millennials. Uh, the millennials are getting older. I'm a millennial. But the Gen Z folks, like, you know, vote for me. Student loan forgiveness. I've got this carrot. Student, student loan forgiveness. You want this carrot? Vote for me. That's that's the approach Joe Biden has now. Once I mean, every time before election, student loan forgiveness, we're going to forgive your student loans. That's what he keeps saying. That's the approach he takes. And then, obviously, some uninformed voters fall for that trap, and they go vote for Biden. Oh, my God. Is that going to happen again? I mean, people, if, if you believe in Joe Biden's student loan forgiveness, let me tell you, that's bad policy. First of all, if you took out the loan... And I have student loans. Right at this very moment, I have student loans. And I'm, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm sharing that with you. I have student loans. All right? I, I get, the, get the monthly statement. And, and they show me. The loan servicer sends me information about, you know, what my monthly payment is and how much has been paid. So, I, you know, I, I, I have student loans. And I'm working hard. To repay those loans. I'm working very hard. Because I understand my responsibility. I understand what I have to do. Now if the government comes and wipes up, wipes out my loan. Now it may seem like oh that's a great thing. My loan just got wiped out. But you know what? If it doesn't happen through the proper process. If, it, if it's just Biden exercising his you know whatever authority he thinks he has. And just forcing that decision on people. Some of the student loan uh, you know, the, the borrowers may, may think, oh, that's great. Biden just wiped out our student loans. We're now loan free. No, that's going to that's going to cause inflation. That's going to cause inflation because somebody is paying for it. 
somehow it's being paid. It, and nothing gets wiped out. I mean, it, it's got to be paid in some way, shape, or form. If the government's spending more money, it, it, it might create inflation pressure. It may just make inflation worse. So, my friends, it's like, you know, the, the Democrats have certain tools that they use. S certain tools that they use to entice young voters to the polling location. And if the young voters fall for those, those traps, then... You know, if Biden gets reelected, then our economy is done. There's not going to be any money. We're going to we're going to do barter after that. Bill, Billy Wiggins writes, um, Maya, a debate. They might do it on split screen. OK. Um, all right. Uh, OK, let me see some more comments here. So, yeah, I mean, JW writes about Biden's guts and stamina to debate. <laughs> you know what? I mean. This is a debate, right? So an incumbent president has to debate. Is Biden going to debate? Is, will there be one debate, two debates, three debates? I think given the, given the uh, you know, the complexity of the situation, I think there should be five debates. I, I really think so. I really think so. Five debates, okay? Five debates. I think there should be five. Now, some might say that's a lot, but no. I mean, given the crisis that we have, given the problems that we're facing, you know, two debates or three debates may not be. I mean, three is still good, but anything less than three is unacceptable. I think there should be five debates. One debate should be let's discuss immigration issues in details. The other debate should be let's talk about the energy policy in details. And perhaps you could put energy and transportation policy in the in the same bucket that's fine and then the other one should be about economy in general talk about the business climate talk about you know uh you know real estate market the housing problems talk about like uh, mortgage rates talk about um uh you know uh the uh, like small businesses small business expansion small business closure Talk about the layoffs that we're seeing in different parts of the country. So there should be one debate focusing on immigration, one on energy, perhaps energy and transportation, one on the economy as a whole. And then there should be uh, one on foreign policy, foreign policy. There, there should be one debate just on foreign policy. And then there should be a fifth debate on just you know topics in general. So I don't know if you agree with what I just said. I propose five debates. Five, okay, here, here you go, five debates. That's what I think should happen. Immigration, energy and transportation, economy in general, foreign policy, and then, you know, just a mix of all topics. Uh, let's see. All right, so my friends, um, I'm waiting for Trump and Biden to debate. Trump obviously said, anytime, anywhere, any place. But what is Biden, Trump said that, what is Biden going to do? Let's wait and see. But I propose five debates. Now, my friends, I'm going to talk about one very important thing. Now, who's paying attention to Mike Gallagher's district? Congressman Mike Gallagher, he's from Wisconsin's 8th congressional district. Anyone paying attention to that race? Because Gallagher's leaving, Gallagher's going to be departing from Congress. He's not running for re-election. Not only, I mean, he's not running for re-election. We know that. But in addition to that, Gallagher's stepping down early. So he's going to be leaving office in April this month. So anyone paying attention to that? Uh, my sisters, are, are you paying attention to that since you're in Wisconsin? Although you're in the second congressional district, that's up in the eighth. Um, but let me know if you're paying attention to that. Billy and JW, uh, please look up 8th Congressional District, okay? Congressional District number 8 in Wisconsin. Follow the news. It is, it is getting so interesting and so exciting. Hard for me to explain. Uh, let, let me see one thing here. Uh, Okay. All right. 
So let me give you some information about what's going on in the 8th Congressional District, okay? So in the 8th Congressional District, uh, there's an open seat, obviously, because uh, Mike Gallagher, the congressman, is leaving office this month. And two candidates announced from the Republican side so, um, okay, J.W., uh, Billy, Billy writes, I'm watching Arizona. Well, Arizona is very important to watch. So, yeah, pay attention to Arizona, but also uh, pay a little bit of attention to the 8th Congressional District in Wisconsin. Like I said, this district is going to have an impact on politics nationwide. J.W. writes, why, what's going on in the 8th District? Well, let me tell you what's going on, J.W. Just give me one second here. Maya Sisters writes, I heard about... Gallagher resigning. The race has been under my radar. We'll make a point to monitor the race. And JW writes, oh, I know about Gallagher. So here's what's going on. The 8th Congressional District, that's, you know about Green Bay, right? Everyone knows Green Bay, right? Everyone knows Green Bay because Green Bay Packers. So Green Bay is in the 8th Congressional District. Obviously, there are lots of other cities there. It's a beautiful part of the state, by the way, Northeast Wisconsin. But the 8th Congressional District, because Gallagher is leaving office this month, there's strong competition in the 8th Congressional District. Who's going to win? I mean, th that's a pretty safe Republican district, okay? And so um, there's competition on the Republican side uh, about, you know, who, who's going to be who's going to who's going to run who's going to win so initially two candidates announced their candidacy for the 8th congressional district from the republican side former state senator roger roth okay if you don't know about him just do a search on the internet roger roth roger roth he used to be a state senator and then in 2022, he ran for lieutenant governor and he got the, the, he won the primary. So he was the, the leading candidate. So, you know, he was in the general election ballot in 2022 as, you know, for the, for the seat of the lieutenant governor. And Tim Michaels was the, was running for governor. So Michaels as, um, uh, as the GOP candidate for governor, Roger Roth as the, um, as the GOP candidate for lieutenant governor. So anyway, we ended up losing that race. So um, the incumbent governor, Tony Evers, got reelected. And then, you know, uh, he, he picked, you know, there was a different person who became his, uh, Tony Evers' lieutenant. Um, in the first term, he had a different lieutenant governor in the second term. Now Tony Evers has a different, different, uh, different person as lieutenant governor. So anyway, Tim Michaels lost the gubernatorial race. Roger Roth, former state senator who was running for lieutenant governor in 2022, he lost. But he is running for Congress from the GOP side. Okay. Uh, okay. So uh, he's running. And obviously, he has name recognition. Roger Roth, he served as a state senator from the area. And then another incumbent state senator named Andre Jock. Andre Jock. You can look him up. Um, he also announced his candidacy. So Roger Roth, Andre Jock, Roger Roth being the former uh, state senator, Andre Jock being the, the sitting state senator, announced candidacy for the 8th Congressional District open seat. And then, people were wondering, who's it going to be? Is it going to be Andre Jack? Is it going to be Roger Roth? Who's going to win? Is it better for somebody to step aside and support one candidate so we can all unite? Or, or is, it, is there going to be a primary and the people get to decide? And then, obviously, Andre Jack has his supporters and Roger Roth has his supporters. So what's, what's it going to be? And then something surprising happened. And this is the interesting part. If you have not paid attention, um, there was a news about this businessman by the name of Tony Weed. Tony W-I-E-D. Tony Weed. A businessman who used to own 
some gas stations and convenience stores um, in Wisconsin. He uh, he uh, ended up reportedly meeting up with Donald Trump when Donald Trump came to Wisconsin. Okay, this month, and then uh, Tony Weed ended up announcing his candidacy for Congress. Okay, and then. Donald Trump endorsed Tony Weed. Okay, so you've got a former state senator, Roger Roth. You've got a sitting state senator, Andre Jack, and then there comes this businessman, Tony Weed, and and Donald Trump endorses Tony Weed. Now, let me just say, I am not. I am personally not making any endorsement in this race. The reason for that is I'm not in the 8th Congressional District. That's not my Congressional District. And then uh, none of the candidates running uh, has personally asked me for endorsement. So they, none of them asked me for endorsement. Uh, so I'm not <laughs> making any endorsement. But I'm just telling you how interesting this, this race in the 8th Congressional District is becoming. You've got a former state senator with name recognition You've got a sitting state senator with name recognition. And then you've got a businessman who, who jumps into the race and gets Donald Trump's endorsement. And so, I mean, you can imagine how interesting things are right now in Wisconsin, particularly in the 8th Congressional District. And so, very, very interesting. Now, you know, somebody might ask, why, 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 didn't, why didn't Donald Trump endorse uh, the former state senator, Roger Roth? Why didn't Donald Trump endorse Andre Jagg, the sitting uh, state senator? I mean, those are, those are great questions. And, and why did Donald Trump pick Tony Weed, uh, you know, a, a businessman, and it g gave such a strong endorsement? Great questions. I don't know the answers to these, but I do know that this race is going to be so heated and it's going to be so interesting. Previously, we thought that there will be two two political figures, Andre Jack, Roger Roth, you know, uh, competing, and may the best person win. And now you've got a third candidate who jumped in. Not only did Tony Weed jump into the race, he got Donald Trump's endorsement. So what does that mean? We're going to have to wait and see. You know, it's... This is going to be very interesting to see how much of influence Donald Trump will have on this race. I mean, JW is here, so I'm going to talk about Ohio. In Ohio, we saw that the governor of Ohio endorsed a different individual, not Bernie Moreno, endorsed a different individual for U.S. Senate. And then Trump endorsed Bernie Moreno. And then there was a third person, too, I think. I'm forgetting the names. So is it going to be the governor's? endorsement or is it going to be Trump's endorsement? Which one's going to win? And what ended up happening is Trump's endorsement won, right? Because Bernie Moreno won. In this case, who is it going to be? You've got a former state senator, you've got a sitting state senator, and then you've got a businessman who jumps in and gets Trump's endorsement. So who's going to win? Is Roger Rod going to win? Is, is Andre Jack going to win? Is Tony Weed going to win? We will have to wait and see. I have no way to predict anything. I understand that Trump's endorsement carries tremendous strength. But then again, you've got a sitting state senator and, and a, a former state senator, and they both have strong name recognition. So this is going to be so interesting. And why does it matter? Because the 8th Congressional District is a solid you know, Republican area is a solid Republican area. So it, it's, it, it, you know, it's likely going to stay, stay in the hands of the Republicans. But what if this three-way primary causes division? What if, you know, this, this, this three-way three primary, um, you know, causes uh, Republicans in the 8th Congressional District to uh, split up and some support Roger Roth strongly, some support Andre Jack strongly, and, and some support Tony Weed strongly because he got Trump's endorsement. 
what's going to happen? And we have to think beyond the primary. So let's see one of, uh, you know, one of them is going to win, right? So whoever wins, whoever wins, <clears throat> what happens to the supporters of the two candidates who don't win? Are those supporters going to say, you know what, three-way race, we voted, our candidate didn't win, you know, this candidate won, now, and so now should we should we unify and support the candidate that won the primary? I mean, really, ideally, yes, that should be the answer. But primaries can really divide people within the same party. So obviously, there's a lot of time between now and the primary. So I, I think people will have to uh, people will have to wait and and see um, and. You know, it's too complicated. Somebody may drop out, right? Somebody may drop out and maybe two people will drop out and only one person will be left. I mean, this Trump endorsement is going to be very, very interesting. Susan Epp is here. Susan, thank you. Glad that you've joined. Good to see that you're here. Maya Sisters is writing, hi, Susan. And JW writes uh, about the governor of Ohio that he endorsed the more moderate guy. You know, sometimes, uh, I mean, it's good to be moderate in some cases, and sometimes the moderate approach doesn't work, especially, you know, uh, in, a, in a solid Trump area. Uh, so this congressional race is going to be very, very important. And, you know, um, we have to keep this seat on the Republican side. So... Ideally, the Republicans cannot allow any division to cause, to cause, you know, fracture in the party. So whoever wins, we're going to have to support that person. So Susan, how are you doing? Good to see that you're here. Uh, so, so far, it's mostly been Maya Sisters and JW and Billy. We're having uh, an interesting, uh, interesting chat here. So glad to see that Susan has joined. Susan, how is the weather where you are? I understand you're still in California. How's the weather? We need to talk about the weather. It's raining here in Madison. Not, not as heavy rain, but still rain. So I'll wait for Susan to type a response to my question about the weather. My friends, as I mentioned, I'm going to be speaking at the Second Congressional District Caucus of the Republican Party on Saturday, April the 13th. So in Cross Plains, if you want to know more, you can, you can send me an email and I'll give you more information. But here's some very interesting thing I'm about to tell you now. I have been talking for the last several minutes. I have been talking about the 8th Congressional District, right? Here's the interesting thing. So the 8th Congressional District includes a county named Door County. Very popular county. My sisters, I'm sure you know what county I'm talking about. Because you're in Wisconsin and Door County is just such a tremendous tourist destination. Scenic beauty. Lovely place. So, Door County Republican Party. Door County Republican Party is having their annual Lincoln Day dinner. Okay? Are, are you all listening? Are you all paying attention? Because I'm, I'm about to share with you a very exciting news. Okay? So, JW, Billy, Susan, my sisters, please continue to listen. And anyone else who's here but has not participated in the live chat, Please listen to this. I've got something exciting to share with you. So in the 8th Congressional District, there are different counties. And Door County is, is one of the most beautiful counties in the state. And Door County is in the 8th Congressional District. So the Republican Party in Door County. So the Republican Party chapter um, in, in, in Door, uh, Republican Party chapter in Door County they are having their annual Lincoln Day dinner. And guess what? All three candidates 
Roger Roth, Andre Jack, and Tony Weed. They are all going to be there. They are all going to be attending that event, and they are all going to be speaking. Obviously, it's going to be a major event uh, because of this this exciting race, and because of so much of anticipation surrounding this congressional race in the eighth district in Wisconsin. So they are all going to be there because I just got the flyer for the event. And guests, who's going to be the special guest speaker? There's going to be one special guest speaker. In it, none of the candidates. So Tony Weed, um, Andrew Jack, and Roger Rod. They are they are they are going to be the candidates. They'll um, they'll be talking about their race and they'll be appealing to the voters uh, to receive their support. But in addition to the candidates, there will be a special guest speaker who is going to be talking about immigration issues at the Lincoln Day dinner. And who's going to be that special guest speaker? I am very honored that I have been invited to speak at that event as the special guest speaker and to share my journey of immigration, legal immigration, and to talk about immigration issues and to talk about the ongoing border crisis and what we can do to fix this problem. So thank you so much. I, I see JW writes you and my sisters writes congrats to us. Thank you so very much. You know, I wanted to share that good news with you. And so if anyone wants to be in Door County on May 4th, that's the date, um, you know, let me know. I, I will be. So what I do is uh, when I when I know um, when I get the confirmation that I'll be speaking at an event and if there's a flyer, I try to share that information through my e-newsletter. And so if I have your email address, I know Susan Epp. Susan, you wrote that the weather will be nice for two days and then not nice for two days. OK, so. I know Susan Epp gave me her email address. So Susan Epp is on my list, uh, on my e-newsletter list. So as soon as I send out information about this upcoming event, uh, Susan Epp uh, is going to receive it, I'm hoping, if everything goes well with the emails. Sometimes I know that emails can bounce back for whatever reason. So Susan, please uh, pay attention to your inbox and wait for that event. Uh, for, for that information. Uh, but anyone else who, who wants to be on my e-newsletter list, please give me your email address. I'll add you to the list, and I try to send out an email once every two weeks. You know, Previously, I called it an, a weekly e-newsletter, but sending out a, a newsletter every week gets to be challenging because you know I obviously have my professional life, and then I have my personal life, and then I have my hobbies, and my podcast and my live stream uh, and my YouTube video. So, uh, you know, sending out an e-newsletter once a week gets to be very challenging. So I do it once uh, every, um, you know, two weeks. So if you want to be on that list, please give me your email address. I'll add you to the list. So JW writes, yes, congrats. My sisters writes, congrats, Tosif. JW writes, if I lived around there, I would come. Thank you, JW. I appreciate that. Billy writes, congrats. Susan Epp writes, congratulations in being a guest speaker. Thank you so very much. And, you know, I want to do the best I can to spread the truth, to highlight the issues. And I think it's important for people to not only hear about immigration issues, but to hear it from a legal immigrant who has been through that journey of legal immigration who has been through the process of naturalization, who became a naturalized U.S. citizen, somebody who is deeply involved in politics, somebody who studied public policy and political science, somebody who is very vocal about immigration issues. I'm not afraid to share my views. I am not. I understand whatever I'm saying on this live stream, whatever I'm publishing on my YouTube channel, this becomes public information. Anyone from any part of the world can view this. And, and, and I'm fearless in expressing my opinions. And so I think it's important 
for people to hear from someone with my experience. And so I am very honored to have this opportunity to speak at this upcoming Lincoln Day Dinner in Door County, in beautiful Door County. And I also understand that there will be some key individuals in the room, people who are running for Congress. And I want to hear what they have to say as well, because I want to hear Roger Roth share his vision, what he's going to do if he becomes the congressman from the 8th District. I want to hear Andre Jack say what his plans are, how he wants to solve problems in Washington if he gets elected. I want to hear Tony Weed speak. And he got endorsed by Donald Trump. So I want to hear what he has to say about his vision for how we can fix the problems that we face as a country. So they'll be there. I want to hear them speak. And obviously, as a special guest speaker, I want to share my views, my thoughts, my opinions. And as always, I'm always happy to answer questions. So if that day people ask me questions, any question is fine. If I don't know the answer, I'll say I don't know the answer. But I want to exercise my First Amendment right to free speech. And that's what I focus on because it's important. If we don't exercise our rights, then our rights are gone. We lose our rights. And the liberals, we know that, that the liberals are always targeting our First Amendment right. The liberals are targeting our Second Amendment right. The liberals keep targeting our rights. They want to take away our rights. They want to diminish our freedom. Look at Bernie Sanders. Look at Elizabeth Warren. Look at Gavin Newsom. These politicians, these liberal politicians, they are working hard to diminish our freedoms. We cannot allow that to happen. So we have to be vocal as Americans. We have to be vocal we have to share our thoughts fearlessly. Um, let me look at some comments. Uh, JW writes, LOL, my life isn't that exciting either. Tosif is very involved. That's great. Well, JW, I think you're also involved because obviously you're spending time on this live stream sharing your thoughts. So, you know, we have to be involved in whatever way we can. You know, I like to write. I like to speak. Um, and I know I have other friends who who um, are active in campaigns and they help help out different conservative candidates by knocking on doors and distributing flyers and, you know, uh, doing graphic design work to help campaigns and to, uh, you know, think about coming up with creative advertisements and commercials. So, you know, we use whatever... Uh, skills we have, whatever we can do to help uh, spread more freedom. And so I like to read, I, I like to read, I like to write, I like to speak. That's what I do. And I appreciate everyone's support uh, in this. Uh, JW writes, I like that you said fearless about sharing your views, Tossif. Unfortunately, cancel culture has diminished some voices, but I think people are starting to gain their courage back. We need to continue to be vocal, okay? Cancel culture, yeah, I know cancel culture is there, and cancel culture likes to silence uh, people who, who are fearless and who speak loudly. Um, you know, I live, <laughs> here's the fun part, I live in one of the most liberal <laughs> areas, uh, probably... <laughs> like the top two most liberal areas in Wisconsin and probably one of the most liberal areas in the country. You know, I step out of my apartment, I go outside. Most people I encounter are, are liberals and they know who I am. A lot of people know who I am because I've done so much of public speaking. I've done so much of writing. I've been to so many events. <laughs> A lot of liberals, the prominent liberals in Dane County, most of them know who I am. Okay, the, the state senators, the state assembly people, uh, people on the city council, um, you know, the mayor in town, they, they know who I am. And I'm like, you know what? I'm happy to be a conservative voice in a liberal area, okay? And I'm going to be fearless. I'm going gonna, I'm, I'm gonna to say what's on my mind. And, you know, I'm not going to be afraid. No fear. No fear. And that's, 
what my mom taught me. That's what my mother taught me. If you are on the right track, if you're not doing anything wrong, there should be no fear. No fear. So that's what I follow, what my mother said. I want to be fearless, okay? Because what I'm saying is the truth. Why should I be afraid? I'm not going to be afraid. Some people are going to hate me. Okay, I, I hope they realize that I'm, I'm telling the truth. But I've, I've gained so much of support. Like when I started live streaming, I started live streaming in January. I, I, I didn't know if people would tune in to listen to my live streams. I, I didn't know if I, I would get any audience. I didn't know if there, you know, people would follow my channel and if people, whether people would participate in the live chat window. And just think about where we are now in just a few months. I've got so many people who participate on a regular basis in the live chat window. People uh, who listen to my comments, who listen to my thoughts, and I learn from them too. And, and JW, you know this, Billy, you know this, and Maya Sisters and Susan Epp, I think you all know this, that I, I frequently say, oh, you know, I, I read a comment in the live chat window, and I say, oh, I didn't know that. Well, you know, I'll, I'll look into it, or, or I'll do more research, because, you know, this is an exchange of information. I think we become stronger as we share knowledge, and if at any, any point somebody wants to disagree with me, that's fine, too. Because I don't want to assume that I'm right in, in, in every aspect, right? I mean, we all learn, so our views evolve. I mean, obviously, there are some views that I have that are never going to change. Like, you know, I, I exercise my First Amendment right. We have to protect our freedom of speech. That's not negotiable. We have to protect our Second Amendment. That's not negotiable. You know, we're never going to be a socialist country. We're not going to adopt socialist policies. There's no compromise in that area. There's no negotiation. We're, we're going to reject socialism, plain and simple. But, you know, in, in terms of local politics, local policies, um, you know, for example, I oppose the wheel tax. If somebody wants to come and, and uh, show me an argument in favor of the city wheel tax, well, I'll probably still oppose the wheel tax, but you know what? All right, if you have an economic argument, if you've got data, if you've got statistics to, to try to justify a wheel tax, okay, let me hear it. I believe in lower taxes. That's, that's clear and simple. But if somebody wants to give me an argument like why the city of Madison has to have a wheel tax, all right, let me, let me hear it. And then I'll tell you if I'm convinced or not. So anyway, I just use a random example, but I am open to hearing people's opinions and their thoughts, and I'm, I'm happy to have a conversation on a topic. And I'm not shy about saying that, hey, I don't know about this. If I don't know about a topic, if I don't have expertise uh, on a particular topic, I'm going to say that because we cannot know everything in the world, right? No matter how much of an expert we are on certain issues, there are so many other issues that we have little knowledge on. So if I don't know something, I'm happy to tell you that, hey, you know, I have to read more or I don't know much about it. And that's fine. Let me read some comments here. Uh, Bill, Billy writes, Arizona sounds like a conservative state, but they kept uh, voting commie. <laughs> oh, you're writing about John McCain. So... There's a lot of tension in Arizona, Billy, and I'm, I'm not in Arizona politics. I've never been to Arizona, um, but I almost feel like I have to go and uh, check it out, the, at least the political environment there. So, you know, if we want, if we want a strong, you know, Senate majority, if we want to regain the majority, I mean Republicans, if we want to regain the majority in the Senate, if, if we want strong senators, the Arizona folks, they have to vote for Carrie Lake. Now, Carrie Lake made some comments about John McCain, which, you know, as I think about it, maybe she should not have made those comments. 
but what happened happened, you know. Um, think about the bigger picture. Is is I mean, if if the people of Arizona, if they vote for Carrie Lake, and if she if she if her election, if her successful elec election helps us regain the majority in the Senate, and she's definitely going to be pro border security and anti illegal immigration. So we do need somebody like Carrie Lake in Arizona as the U.S. Senator. But I know that a lot of John McCain supporters are not going to, they are not happy about Carrie Lake. But think about the bigger picture. What if the John McCain voters don't support Carrie Lake? What happens then? Carrie Lake loses the election and then what? We lose an opportunity to regain a, a Senate seat in Arizona. I mean, Arizona, we had, we had Republican senators in Arizona, and now we don't, right? And, and so how can we regain the Senate seats in Arizona? That's the bigger picture we have to think about. Uh, let's see. Um, uh, Billy writes, if McCain was still around, he would win. Yeah, I think I, I kind of understand that people in Arizona, they love John McCain. Um, and so, uh, Billy also writes, Carrie Lake is better. Yep. Um, uh, JW writes, yes, Arizona is very strange that they'll vote for Trump, but won't vote for Republican senators and governor. You know, uh, I don't know what's going on in Arizona. Sometimes it, it's just hard, hard to figure out what the people think. You know, sometimes people, they, they do cross voting on the same ballot, on the same ballot. They'll vote for a, a Democrat for governor and a Republican for U.S. Senate. That, that happens. That has happened. Okay? And so uh, I don't know why people do that, but people do. I mean, people do that. So, I mean, I don't know why. Uh, uh, let's see. Um, so Billy has some comments about McCain. Um you know, I was, so I came to the United States in 2007, and obviously it was a totally different environment back then. The political environment was very different. I mean, it was pretty heated, but um, uh, nothing like what we see today. And so in 2007, I came to the U.S. for the first time, and 2008 is when the the big presidential election was so i i landed on u.s soil when when george bush uh was the president so in 2007 right because obama got elected in 2008 and he got sworn into office in 2009 um so you know i i remember the presidential debates uh during the 2008 election cycle I, I, I remember that. I remember uh, John McCain and the others, Ron Paul. Uh, I think Rick Perry was there too at the time, right? Rick Perry might have been there. Uh, Mike Huckabee, right? Mike Huckabee was running. I, I, I may be making a few mistakes. I don't know. But I remember Mike Huckabee, Ron Paul, John McCain. Now, was Herman Cain, did he run back in 2008 or was it... Um, was it later during the 2012 election cycle? I, I forget. I forget when Herman Cain was running. Anyway, um, so I, I remember, and that was back when, in 2008, I was not a U.S. citizen then. Uh, I was an immigrant, a legal immigrant, and I, I was paying a lot of attention. I was... Um, you know, I was very excited, uh, you know, a young, young man I was back then, and I was learning a lot. I studied political science in school, um, uh, and, you know, also paid attention to, to politics, and it was exciting. It was a learning experience for me, so I remember uh, I, I was a strong supporter of John McCain. Obviously, back then, I could not vote because... I didn't have my citizenship back then. Only U.S. citizens can vote. And so, you know, I, 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 I became a citizen in 2014. So in 2008, I could not vote, but um, I 
was deeply involved in observing and and watching the debates and listening to the political arguments and I, you know I, I was I was impressed by 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 John McCain back then um, you know he he looked like uh, he would he would be a great president and I was I was looking forward to seeing John McCain win in 2008 obviously that did not happen and in the, and then in 2012 um, um, 2012 was also quite exciting. You know, Mitt Romney seemed like he would do great, but um, did not perform as well. Uh, one exciting thing in 2012 was that Paul Ryan of Wisconsin, uh, you know, rising star at the time, he was the he was the vice presidential candidate, um, uh, and you know, it would have been a pretty big deal for Wisconsin if uh, Paul Ryan would have been the vice president, uh, but that didn't happen. Obviously, we know Paul Ryan ended up becoming the, the speaker, which um, also uh, was a big accomplishment uh, for Paul Ryan and, and for Wisconsin. Now, I do understand that people have different thoughts about Paul Ryan. You know, even in Wisconsin, some people love him, some don't still. But I'm, I'm not going into that discussion. All I'm saying is that having a Speaker of the House from Wisconsin was a big deal. And I remember those years uh, very well. Uh, Billy writes, make sure you practice your speech. I will do that, Billy. You know, I, I talk about immigration so much. I feel like, uh, you know, you can, you can just ask me to speak at any time and I, 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 can, I can talk easily for, you know, half hour or an hour. But yeah, definitely, I'll organize my speech. I'll make sure I have all my, you know, important points ready. So th thank you for that ad advice, Billy. Appreciate it very much. Um, yeah, JW writes, wasn't he prisoner of war for years, McCain? Uh, yes, McCain was a uh, prisoner of war. Um, uh, okay, Billy writes, I didn't pay attention to politics until Ross Perot came in. Okay, yeah, I wasn't, I wa <laughs> I wasn't here for... Uh, the the Ross Perot, you know, things that happened a long time ago. Um, so JW writes, I do have respect for him, meaning McCain, for that because he must, but because that, yeah, that must have been horrific. Yeah, being a being a prisoner of war, that's horrific. So obviously John McCain went through a lot. I mean, he's 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 done a lot for the country, and um, you know, I I, I think. Um, being in politics uh, brought him to a point where some people loved him and they still love him and some don't. That's the nature of politics. But uh, in terms of military service, obviously John McCain is a hero. Um, so B Billy, Billy has very different views about John McCain. I can see that, Billy, you're writing those. Um, and that's fine because you know what, Billy? Uh, as I said, we all have to express what we think, our opinions, our views. So JW wrote that um, he has respect for John McCain for that reason, because McCain was a prisoner of war. Billy is voicing uh, a, a totally different opinion uh, regarding John McCain. Um, all right. So Billy is saying, talk about inflation, who creates it? Uh, well, reckless government spending leads to inflation. So, Billy, are you suggesting that I, during my speech next month, I talk about inflation? I, I may mention that uh, my my speech will primarily focus on uh, on the border crisis and immigration, but I, I can talk about inflation too. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's a it's a big topic. So Billy writes, why aren't we on a gold system? So have you? All right, Billy, there's a book by Ron Paul. Ron Paul wrote a book, End the Fed, okay? I'm, I'm not saying that I endorse uh, Ron Paul's views. I'm not saying that I don't endorse Ron Paul's views, but he writes about the Fed, the Federal Reserve System, and so... Um, you know, you can read that book if you have not read it already. End the Fed by Ron Paul. I think it's by Ron Paul. Yeah, I think it's by Ron Paul. Uh, I can look it up. Um, 
Uh, anyway, I, I, I'll look it up, but I, I think it's by Ron Paul. Can somebody look look up the book on the internet and the Fed and whether it's by Ron Paul? I think it's by Ron Paul. Or is it Rick Perry? I'm, I'm trying to figure out. I read something by Rick Perry. I read something by Ron Paul. I may be mixing it up. Um, let, let me do one thing here real quick. I'm going to, I'm going to try to look it up. Just give me one second. All right. Um, let me look it up here. And mm, the fed. Give me one second. Uh, got my laptop here. My internet is being a little funny. I'm going to I'm gonna connect it to internet. Let me let me see. Uh, so Billy writes, "You're right. I like Ron Paul and Rand. Yeah, both are both are great." Uh, okay, and the Fed book. Mm, it's by Ron Paul. I read the book. Yeah, so I confirmed that. I looked it up on the internet. And the Fed. It's a, it's a book by Ron Paul. So, Billy, if you like Ron Paul, you should check out that book. It's a really good book. And obviously, you you mentioned you like Rand Paul also, uh, who is a sitting U.S. senator. All right. So, and any any book recommendations from you, uh, please let me know. Billy writes, Monetary Realist by M Merrill Jenkins, if you want to learn about the money issue. I'm going to look it up right now, Billy. Give me one second. Uh, Monetary Realist by Merrill. By Merrill Jenkins. Let me see. Mm. Merrill Jenkins. Is that a book or is that... Um, is, is that a like a blog? I'm trying to find the book. Jenkins. Okay, I I see. I see a book by Merrill Jenkins. It's called Money, the Greatest Hoax on Earth. Um, I see that book. Mm, let me see. Billy writes, Rand Paul is a surgeon. Yep, Rand, Rand Paul is a, is, is a doctor. Um, let's see, Merrill Jenkins. Rand Paul. Mm, biography, let's see. Let me, give me one second here. Mm-mm-mm-mm. I've got my internet right here, and so I can uh, I can look things up, things up as we speak. Um, yeah. So yeah. Um, so we were talking about Ron Paul and Rand Paul. Yeah, Ron Paul, a uh, great political figure, and Rand Paul, um, you know, a surgeon and a sitting U.S. senator. Um, you know, libertarians, freedom-loving people, no doubt about that. So thanks for the book recommendations. So at this time, I'm just going to say, are there other people who are tuned in for this live stream but has not written anything yet in the live chat window? Please say something. Say Write something. Uh, you don't have to reveal your true name if you don't want to. You can just um, write the name of the state that you're from. You can write how you came across my channel. Uh, you can write and let me know if this is your first time or if you've been to this channel before but you've you've not written anything or if you've not participated in the live chat please write something in the live chat window give this video a thumbs up give this live stream a thumbs up support this channel by giving a thumbs up please anyone who's li listening all you have to do is just hit the thumbs up hit the like button and like this channel help me spread my message help me reach a bigger audience my friends um, uh, Billy writes, he intended the change mechanism in the vending machines. Who, uh, who, Billy, are you referring to? 
who are you referring to the the author of the book or or um rand paul i'm i'm gonna wait for you to respond and then i'm looking at my bookshelf too let's see um uh well, you know, I need to, I need to, I, I need to reorganize my library a little bit here. Um, all right. Uh, let's see. By the way, I've read some books on. Oh, yeah, Billy is writing about Merrill Jenkins. All right, I'll I'll do more research on the on the on the author on the author. Okay, so, uh, you know, I enjoy reading uh, books on healthcare policy. So there's a book that I read. It's called The Long Fix. Uh, I read it a while back, but it's a, it's a good book. The Long Fix by Vivian Lee, MD. Uh, it's a good book I read. And, you know, whenever I read these books, I not only, like, just read them, but I also, um, but I also make a lot of notes, all right? So you, uh, as you turn the pages of the book, you, you're you're gonna see that I've I've written notes, I've made underlines, I've put stars next to important points, and so that helps me if I ever revisit a book, I can I can look at what I thought were the important pieces. So when did I buy this book? I bought this book in 2021. So that's when I read it. Okay, in 2021. So it's it's been a few years. Uh, but very, very good book. I recommend that you read it. Let's see. Uh, what other book do I have? Uh, lots, lots, lots of books, but out of my reach at this point, so I'm not going to reach out and grab those books. Anyway, um, anyone here who has not yet participated in the live chat window, we're approaching the two-hour mark. I still have a lot of energy to continue, uh, but if you have to go, you just let me know, okay, <laughs> that you have to go. But I'm here. Uh, oh, Billy writes, I reference through all mine also. Yeah, you know, I because, you know, a lot of the books I read are nonfiction. So healthcare policy books, energy policy, you know, different things, history. And so um, I have to, I have to, um, you know, Underline, make notes as I'm reading, as I'm turning the pages, because as I said, the next time I read a, that book, if I revisit it, um, you know, I can just look at the pages and see where the main points are. Sometimes it's, you know, also good to maybe attach a few sticky notes, and that that way you can keep track of the pages. And Billy writes, sometimes my spelling sucks. Your spelling is fine, Billy. You know, when we are chatting, we're not we're not typing an official letter. Right, so we use uh, abbreviations and and short shorter versions of the actual correct spelling. So that's fine. Like you wrote instead of through t h r o u g h, you wrote t h r u, and that's fine. I mean, right? I mean, we're. I mean, this is not a formal uh, presentation. This is not, uh, you know, uh, a research paper. This is not an official document or a letter that we're writing. This is just chat. We are all casual. You know, I'm see. I'm I'm not wearing a tie. I'm just wearing my, my my um, you know, uh, informal casual clothing, and and that's that's perfect. You know, when I'm when I do speeches up on stage, I have my coat on, I have my tie on, and I look a little bit more formal. But this is just for us to have, you know, a nice conversation, to talk about important stuff, to share ideas. So don't worry about spelling, Billy. So, Billy, how are things going on in New York? How are things? Now, did you say you're in Brooklyn or did you say you're in Queens? I think Queens, right? Queens? So, how, how are things in Queens? I'll, I'll wait for you to respond. Not a problem. Once again, my friends, important reminder, if you are tuning in for this live stream, please write some live chat window, okay? Write something in the live chat window. Participate, and that way, uh, you know we can we can engage in a conversation. Um, and I I'm always curious to know 
how many different states my viewers are from? Um, so we have uh, viewers on this channel who are from New York and Wisconsin, South Dakota, Arizona, New Mexico, California, Ohio, Arkansas, Florida, and, and there are other states that I'm forgetting to mention. Uh, so I, I want to know uh, what other, uh, uh, you know, people from what other states are watching my live stream. So please, if you're watching this, if you have not uh, engaged in a conversation in the live chat window, please do. So I just keep reminding. I would appreciate if you do that. So Billy writes, I grew up in Brooklyn and now live in Queens. And Billy writes, Adams is still giving away money like crazy. So that's why, Billy, I call Eric Adams the worst mayor in America. <laughs> You know, I, I criticize Brandon Johnson a lot. I criticize Mike Johnston in Denver uh, quite a bit. But Eric Adams, he's just unbelievable what, what he's doing. Unbelievable. I mean, he's just spending money, taxpayer dollars on the migrants. You know, that debit card thing that he's doing, it's just, it's just unbelievable. Billy writes, Brooklyn is now my old country, LOL. Uh, yeah. You know, Brooklyn and, and Bronx and last time I was in New York was in 2007. I have not, I have not been to New York since 2007. It's been a while. You know, sometimes I feel like I should make a weekend trip to New York and just do a, a live broadcast from New York. Like, hey, this is Tosif coming to you live from New York City. And this is the sanctuary city uh, and, and badly affected by the migrant crisis. So that's why I came from all the way, uh, all the way from Wisconsin to New York City to do this live stream. So this is what I should say when I do a live stream from New York, if I ever get to do it, right? Wouldn't that be awesome? Wouldn't that be awesome if I do a live stream from New York City? JW uh, is writing a comment. Uh, JW writes, I don't think Eric Adams is as bad as some of the other really progressive mayors. Yep, JW, I, I think you're right. There are some other really progressive mayors. Maybe they are mayors of cities that are not as big as New York City. So I think that's how Eric Adams gets so much of attention because he is the mayor of a major city. So, you know, there's more news about Eric Adams. I think it's more easy to criticize Eric Adams. But, you know, JW, I think, I think you're right. There are some other really, really like far left mayors, uh, but probably they don't have as big of a jurisdiction as Eric Adams has in New York. So that's that's how we end up being. That's how we end up, you know, knowing more about what Adams is doing in New York. But, you know, I think there are some mayors and city council members in like California and other places in Illinois that are probably even more far left, even a lot more far left. Uh, Billy writes, Adams is getting bad advice from someone. You know, who is it? Who is, who it, who is Adams getting advice from? You know, maybe a lot of far left uh, advisors there, right? Um, JW writes, at least he has law enforcement background, and at least he admitted that the illegal immigrant issue could ruin their city. That was a brave statement from a liberal. Yeah, yeah. So I did not, yeah, I think, yeah. So I know he, he has law enforcement background. And, you know, I, you know sometimes I, I, I think somebody should really sit down with Eric Adams and just have like a casual conversation like Adams. Explain your position. What are you doing to the city? What are you, why are you doing this? You know, that's, that's something I want to ask Eric Adams. Like, why are you doing this? You know, why are you not prioritizing the American citizens? Why are you so busy with, uh, you know, helping the illegals? You know, focus on the Americans. You are a, a cop. So, you know, support the men and women of law enforcement. You know, uh, make sure that the repeat offenders are not out on the streets to commit more crimes, that they, that they stay behind bars. So, you know, Adams can really help New York, but I don't know why he's not doing it. Um, okay. 
JW writes, Brandon in Chicago is very far left. Oh, yeah, Brandon Johnson. So, you know, one of these days, I'm just going to drive to Chicago again. Um, my trip is overdue. I got to go to Chicago. I got to make a trip to Chicago. Uh, maybe do a live stream from Chicago. <clears throat> Billy Wiggins writes, Adams has a bad taste in his mouth about the police. I, I don't know what, why that would be. You know, if he served in law enforcement, he should write, uh, he, he should like and support law enforcement, right? Um, okay. <laughs> All right, I see Billy's funny comment there. All right. So we, oh my God, we, we just crossed the two-hour mark. That's awesome. So that's how much engaged we are in this conversation two hours went by can you can you believe that we've been we've been chatting for two hours that's awesome thank you for staying with me i'll, I'll continue for a little longer susan writes the illegals here have gotten so much massive in numbers that except for deportation i have no clue what can be done and so you know that's something that trump's gonna have to work on is Trump going to deport? Is there going to be a massive deportation project that Trump's gonna, uh, you know, uh, uh, you know, uh, Trump's gonna propose? We have to wait and see. We have to wait and see, my friends. I'm just hoping for Donald Trump to be back in the office. Oh my God, I, Donald Trump. So I'm waiting for more rallies. I hope Trump does more and more and more rallies in Wisconsin. As I've said before, he was up in Green Bay. I hope he does a rally in the Waukesha, Milwaukee area. I hope he does a rally somewhere in central Wisconsin or northwest Wisconsin. And I would really love for Trump to do a rally in southwest Wisconsin. Um, but I think uh, if Trump wants to be in southwest Wisconsin, he may just end up doing a, a rally in Dubuque and so he can get people from Iowa, the state of Iowa, to attend that rally, as well as people from southwest Wisconsin. But I would really want to see Trump do a rally in southwest Wisconsin, maybe maybe in Prairie du Chien, maybe in La Crosse. A rally in La Crosse would be really awesome. Okay. Uh, so if you don't know where Prairie du Chien is, where La Crosse is, just look it up on a map. These are communities in southwest Wisconsin. All right. Uh, um, and yeah, JW. So yes, the first step should be to secure the border. The first step should be to, you know, make sure that the border is secure. And then and then the uh, and, and then Trump can can think about, OK, what to do with the massive number of illegal immigrants uh, who enter the country to deport or you know what what's the what 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 are the options so i understand that the first step i i i i agree jw the first step should be secure the border and then we're going to talk about what we're going to do next so the border security must be the first priority and border security means not just you know building the the physical wall i mean yes we need a physical barrier absolutely we need a wall but we need personnel we need border patrol agents and the border patrol agents must have the resources that they need uh, to be able to do their job. And then we also need technology. So we need a physical barrier, a wall. Uh, we need personnel um, with resources and we need technology. So all these are very important in making sure that, um, you know, uh, the border is secure. So uh yeah uh so my friends um let's see some comments here um uh, billy writes that trump's gonna have a tough time as president well you know trump faced lots of challenges during his first term i mean he chose a lot of people uh for his cabinet positions and then he figured out that some of the choices he made for different cabinet cabinet positions are not really great choices and so then you know he fired some people and then he uh, uh then he appointed new people and so he had to go through lots of changes in his administration i think that was quite challenging 
And so I, I just hope that when he gets uh, elected again uh, in 2024, when Trump, hopefully that's what I'm hoping for, when Trump is sworn into office, in 2025 as president, I hope that he's going to uh, really, um, you know, pick the right people for the different cabinet positions, and especially Secretary of State, Secretary of Defense, Secretary of Transportation, Secretary of Homeland Security. Uh, these are going to be very, very important positions. Obviously, the Secretary of Housing and Urban Development will also be a very important position because we know that um, uh, you know, housing is a huge issue, and also education, Secretary of Education, that's going to be a hugely important position. So we're going to have to see who he picks. All right, my friends, um, we have crossed the two-hour and five-minute time mark. Um, I don't know if you want to uh, talk more, if you want to chat more, or should we should we end the live stream here? Any thoughts? Uh, um, all right. Um, okay. So I may just end the live stream here because we've been here for more than two hours and six minutes at this point. I want to thank each and every one of you for tuning in. Thank you so very much. Your participation, your comments, your questions really help, you know, this conversation move forward. So thank you, my friends. Oh, Jim. Jim writes, Solar Jim from Chicago, new sub. Oh, wonderful. So, Jim, I was about to end this live stream, and then you came here. <laughs> okay. Wonderful, Jim. Thank you. Subscribe and stay connected. You know, this has been one of the longest live streams that I've done on this channel because we just crossed the two-hour, six-minute time mark. So, Jim, you're from Chicago. Thank you for, for um, joining. I hope you can... Uh, stay connected to my channel, watch my videos, and and also, uh, you know, uh, participate in future live streams. So, uh, you know, I can, so I know JW needs to head out. JW is saying, I will head out, time for bed. Uh, good night all, well, good night JW, thank you for joining. But I may, I may hang out here for a few more minutes because I see that we have a new subscriber. Um, uh, Jim is here. So Jim... Uh, thank you. I'm I'm in Madison, Wisconsin, so not far from Chicago, and I try to do these live streams um, every night. You know, at least five times a week, but really every night. And so I'm glad that you've joined. I hope you'll stay connected with me. And I'm not far from from Chicago because I'm in Madison, Wisconsin, and I do discuss a lot of Chicago issues on this channel. I talk about the migrant crisis, the homelessness. Uh, the crime situation, and lots of other things. And Jim, uh, if you don't know this already, I, I have conservative viewpoints. So I'm a conservative, strong Republican, strong Trump supporter. Um, I don't know what your political views are, but um, you know, uh, you may be a conservative or not. doesn't matter. I'm glad that you're here, and I hope you'll be a part of the, um, uh, or will be a part of the conversation. Because, you know, on this channel... We're talking about spreading spreading the truth, and we are freedom-loving Americans, and we love our country. We want strong border security. We want uh, a, a properly functioning free market. We want limited government and more freedom. So, you know, on this channel, uh, a lot of the people who participate in the live chat window, they are, they are freedom-loving Americans who want to see peace and prosperity in the country and around the world. So, Jim, thank you for jo joining and for, uh, you know, for, for subscribing. And I hope that you'll, uh, you'll, you'll stay connected. So with that, my friends, I'm going to end this live stream. We just crossed the two hour and nine minute time mark. Uh, thank you, everyone. Susan, thank you so much. Have a good night. JW, thank you so much. Jim, you're a new subscriber, as you said. Thank you so much. Billy Wiggins, thank you so very much for, for tuning in. And anyone else who I may have missed, uh, uh, Maya Sisters was, was here earlier. So Maya Sisters, thank you. And thanks to everyone else uh, who tuned in but perhaps did not participate in the live chat window. That's fine. Uh, I'm glad that you tuned in. I'm glad that you uh, 
that you are interested in my channel and you uh, and 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 you watch my videos. So thank you everyone. Have a wonderful night. I'll be back with more videos, more content, more live streams. So please stay connected. And Jim, please come back again for another live stream. Have a good night, everyone. Thank you.